It is my honor and privilege this morning to introduce our guest speaker for the day, the Reverend Gail Bowman. Uh, Reverend Go Bowman is a second career minister, having spent the first, um, her first life practicing law in Washington, D.C. She worked for a lobbying firm, law firm, as well as on Capitol Hill in the Senate and House Judiciary Committees. We could use you there today, sis. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, after attending and graduating from Howard University School of Divinity following the receipt of her degree and ordination, Reverend Bowman did historical research for Howard Youth Ministry and uh, seminary administration before finding her professional home in college chaplaincy at Spelman College in Atlanta and then later at Dillard University in New Orleans. Reverend Bowman earned her BA from the University of Iowa and a doctorate of Jewish prudence from Harvard she has also served as the chaplain and director of the Willis D. Weatherford Jr. Campus Christian Center and, and at one time um, at Howard. And at one time, she was on the faculty of the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. So right down the street. Uh, Reverend Bowman is a writer as well. Uh, she has several articles and one book, I believe to her credit, Praying the Sacred in Secular Settings. And she resided in New Orleans for over a decade and survived Hurricane Katrina. Um, so she brings a unique, rich perspective, a uniquely rich perspective on the experience of, of what it means to be the beloved uh, community, building and living in the beloved community. Reverend Gill currently resides in Birmingham, Alabama where she is engaged in historical research and continues to speak and preach as opportunities arise. But in addition to her many accomplishments, even more importantly, Reverend Gail is the sister and sister-in-law to our own beloved Linda and Coleman Lane. I think you probably see the family resemblance and you will hear it when she begins to speak. So we thank God that, um, Linda brought Reverend Gail to our attention and after working for over a year to make this happen, we are finally able to hear from her. So we thank God for her and for them and we look forward to receiving God's word from Reverend Gail this morning. So I invite her to now um, join our worship service and bless us with God's word today. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good? Ooh. I'm echoing. Should I do something? Let's not worry about it just now. Uh, good morning, East Liberty Presbyterian Church. I am delighted. I am pleased to be with you this morning. Greetings from Birmingham, Alabama. I want to thank all of the pastors that were involved. This was a lot of work for them, y'all. Uh, uh, I want to thank Reverend Randy Bush uh, for the invitation and Reverend uh, Patrice Searcy Fowler for all the work that she did back and forth with me and Reverend Heather Schoenwolf also as well. After I heard her marvelous uh, sermon last Sunday, I felt like I knew her already. Uh, it has been marvelous. I have been with you all every Sunday for both of the Sunday worships for all of the month of February. So I've heard the marvelous preaching and the glorious music and just the uh, energetic membership and so forth and so on. It has been a pleasure. Uh, for me, and I thank you for being with me this morning as well. Our scripture for today is taken from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 8 and 31 through 35. Let us listen for the word of God. Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. 
Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you are going there again? And then the text skips to the point where Jesus has gone to Bethany. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. This is the word of God given for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, please open up a place in your word so that we can step into it and be entirely surrounded and engulfed by your wisdom, your grace, your love, and everything it is you have to say to us today. Ready us for this moment. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. And in your name we pray, amen. Black History Month is different this year. Black History Month is different because of last spring and summer and fall as Breonna Taylor and Amon Arbery and George Floyd found each other on common cruel ground. On that common cruel ground, these three held each other's hands, then together they reached out their hands to us. And gradually, then suddenly, the truth of what more of us needed to know and what more of us needed to be doing rose from beneath us and made a fresh purpose known. So this is not a Black History Month, even remotely like last year's Black History Month, when in too many places, not at ELPC, but in too many places, we were still settling for nothing more than the ritualistic retelling of one of the nation's favorite pieces of fiction presented as fact. The piece of fiction I'm referring to, of course, is the story in which in 1955, a woman just happened to refuse to relinquish her seat on a segregated Montgomery, Alabama bus and just happened to spark a totally unplanned citywide bus boycott. You all know better. At ELPC, you all know that the woman, Rosa Parks, had had years of training and oppression resistance, that she was secretary of the local NAACP chapter, that she had been selected with her agreement to refuse to obey what the entire black community of Montgomery and endless communities beyond it knew to be an unjust law. Equally important, many of you already knew that the carefully and strategically planned Montgomery bus boycott was consistent with a long held pattern of practice of resistance to segregation, mistreatment, and injustice in Alabama, coupled with intelligent assessment in many places of how African-Americans could eke out tiny scraps of progress from every system staged against them. Since I'm speaking to you from Birmingham, let's add this. In early 1721, a slaver, that is a ship of captives from Africa, the, the Africaine docked in Biloxi, part of the French Louisiana colony and what later became Mississippi. It had sailed from San Malo, France to Wida, West Africa on the coast of what is today Benin. Wida had a massive market where Europeans, including the French, competed actively with one another to buy captives and provisions for the trip to the new world. In the 1920s, captives, 1720s, I'm sorry, captives were sometimes purchased with gunpowder. In March 1721, 300 years ago next month, 182 of the surviving captives brought to Biloxi arrived in Mobile to begin the bulking up of the black population of what would later become Alabama. They came 
enslaved. Historians inform us that of those 182 captives, given the ratios that the French favored, there would have been 118 males and 64 females. 27% of them would have been children, which means 48 of them were under the age of 15. And from everything I can tell from my research thus far, resistance had begun at the point of capture in Africa. Resistance continued to and in the new world. Resistance never ceased. In other words, the Montgomery bus boycott should not have come as a complete surprise to any of us. Thanks to the Head Start and the sense of direction given to us by Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black History Week in 1926, we continue to do the digging and ask the questions such that our present situation is less of a mystery to us. May the voices for change continue to increase. Because of 2020, for additional numbers of people in this country and around the world, the acceptability of approaching Black History Month as a low risk, minimal investment, simple turn of the page of a calendar burst like a cheap bubble from a disreputable toy store. My friends, we have come to Black History Month this year with prior experience. We have vivid and immediate and heartbreaking prior experience in one of the deep things of the world. A deep thing is a thing that is more. It may present initially as something we have encountered and dealt with before, but it is sizable in scope, complex in ramifications, and often, as we discover, knows a number of things we don't. Deep things can move us. Good, th good deep things can move us. Bad deep things, including challenges, can move us. We recognize deep by how it moves us. There's a stirring inside. There's an awakening. There's a brush of immeasurability across our awareness. There's a sense that we are in close proximity to one of the things that we human beings are created to touch or endure or become or devise or understand or change. Deep can be when something you need to know about another person or a group of persons sits you down and talks to you clear. In my years of preaching, I've tried to keep to this. Oh God, if you pick the text and talk to me, I'll do the work. For today, the text God chose was John 11, verse 35. In the Revised Standard Version, Jesus began to weep in the King James Version, Jesus wept. This is the shortest verse in all of the 66 books of the Bible, but, and, it is a problematic verse. Two things. First, that little tiny verse, Jesus wept, is found in the midst of one of the most dense and complicated chapters the Gospels have to offer. All kinds of things are going on in this text. Second, about our verse, it is not quite possible to say definitively that we know exactly and for sure what John 11:35 Jesus began to weep means. Nevertheless, as I began to sweat it out, oh God, why this? I noticed, and you all are a sharp bunch, so y'all probably noticed this before I did, that we are already in one of the most dense chapters in our nation's history and in our own lives. All kinds of things are going on in this moment. Pandemic, social change, crippled economy, climate change, income inequality, a nation struggling to choose between being wise and worthy or being self-impressed. And for us, it is not quite possible to say definitively that we know for sure what this means. Is it an end? Is it a beginning? Or could it be the end of a beginning that sets up the possibility for a better middle? Who can say? As the popular song once put it, makes me want to holler, throw up both my hands. These days, it would appear that we are having vast and unprecedented experience in the deep things of this world. It's awful, it's wonderful, it's horrific, it's startling, it's difficult to describe. And so far, it is very, very hard to understand. As our scripture opens, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are siblings. They live together. We don't know why none of them are married, but they do not appear to be married. They are for each other. 
Lazarus' name is a shortened version of Eleazar, which means God helps. The Lazarus, Mary, Martha family group is living in Bethany. Bethany is in the region of Judea, two miles from Jerusalem. Bethany isn't just a village, it's a neighborhood. People know each other, they care about each other, they look out for each other. It's like a church or it's like Pittsburgh with its plethora of neighborhoods. People in Bethany know people in Jerusalem. The Mary, Lazarus, Martha group is connected to their neighborhoods nearby in Bethany and they're connected to their neighbors just a little further on in Jerusalem. As our text opens, Jesus is living, traveling and conversing with his disciples and no doubt some others, including some women who travel with the group or meet up with the group occasionally. After all, somebody needs to cook. Jesus is friends with Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Each of them is his friend. Jesus is also friends with his disciples each of them is his friends, despite the fact that the teaching is going very well, but the learning is going not so well. And the Jesus group is friends with the Mary Lazarus Martha group. What I'm trying to say is that there's a great deal of connection between these people. They show up for each other. There is love. As our scripture opens, all appears to be fine, normal. However, Jesus' time physically walking and teaching and healing on this earth is drawing to a close. The danger to Jesus from religio-political forces in the region near Bethany is rapidly on the rise. Lazarus is about to fall dangerously ill. Mary and Martha will soon send for, then pray for, then beg for Jesus to come to Lazarus' rescue. And evil, sin, pride, indifference, greed, denial, and fear are already present on the scene here and there, as the scriptures warn us, they almost always are. In other words, all the elements for things to go deep are in place, just as this time last year, all the elements for things to go deep with us were in place, we just didn't perceive it yet. The action in our text is set in motion in this way. Lazarus gets sick unto death. Mary and Martha sent for Jesus, Jesus doesn't go. He stays in his ministry work, he continues his teaching. After a time, Jesus says, we are going to Judea. His disciples are horrified and remind him the last time he was there, the officials tried to kill him. Jesus explains that Lazarus has fallen asleep, he's going to wake him up. The disciples say, well, what's the problem? If he's sleeping, that's fine. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. He's passed. Then he adds that it is good that he didn't go to Lazarus before he died. Now they will all go to Lazarus so that his disciples may believe. And the disciples respond. Say what? Groups on the move. The Jesus group crosses over the River Jordan heading west into Judea. The Bethany group shows up for the grieving Mary and Martha. The Jerusalem group shows up for the grieving Mary and Martha. The Jesus group shows up for the grieving Mary and Martha. When Mary rises to leave the house, the others think she is going to weep at Lazarus' tomb. They're not going to leave her to cry by herself, so they follow her. And that's how it happens, that everybody is there when Mary and Jesus meet. Mary tells Jesus, she knows he could have saved Lazarus if he had just been able to make it in on time. She believes, but considers that the timing worked against them. And everybody loses it. They begin to weep. Into that veil of tears, even as he continues to cope with the struggle of trying to bring those who want to believe to faith, Jesus asks a question that in its nature confirms the reality that his friend Lazarus is now four days dead and buried. He asked, where have you laid him? And through their tears, the oddly mixed multitude says, <clears throat> pardon me, come Lord, come and see. Jesus begins to weep, Jesus weeps. There are problematic deep things 
that we shall not banish from this earth. There are mountains that we are not destined to move. And that's where Jesus comes in. There he stands, one foot in the here and the other foot in the hereafter with full prior and personal experience and all the deep things of the world except one. And if when he raises his friend so dear Lazarus from the grave, Jesus will willingly seal the deal, so to speak, in bringing about his own death. On behalf of Lazarus, soon Jesus will act. But first, he weeps. On behalf of all of us, Mary, Martha, the Bethany group, the guests from Jerusalem, the disciples, the hangers on, the worship journey, uh, singing group, the worship candle lighting families, the individuals in their homes, Fauci taking a walk hand in hand with his wife, a struggling 14 year old wandering Sunday morning Mexican streets, all dear, all beloved, you and me, soon Jesus will raise his face to God and then he will raise his hand and give death a command and give time another and restore Lazarus to this world. He will do what we cannot do. But first he joins us in doing what we sometimes need to do. How very deep a moment can be. Jesus began to weep. Life can be so deep, beloved of the Most High. Some things go better than we hope and there is wonder. Some things go worse and later sometimes make more sense than they did at the time or not. And some things are just hard, difficult, complicated, nuanced, tough. Racism is a mean, cruel, old piece of evil earthly business with roots more than a millennium long. But just because it's long and old, does not mean it's permanent. It is ours to figure out. It is ours to uproot and destroy. We are called to do this, but we are not alone in the struggle. Old folks wisely say, and I'm a fully qualified old folk now, God may not come when you want God to come, but God's always right on time. Jesus, our friend, our savior, our all experienced in the deep things of this world and more is always right on time. He abides, caring for us, caring about us, at times even caring, caring in us when it is beyond us to care. There is love. We are loved. And it's not just that we are loved, you are loved. Fiercely, firmly, joyously, immeasurably, you and yours are loved. So weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy does come and so can change. Ask Lazarus, God helps. In losing the three, Brianna and Ahmad and George and so many others, after the tears, it was time to pray and work such that they did not give their lives in vain. I, for one, am convinced that they did not. We will do everything we can to ensure that they did not die for nothing. So let's walk on, children. Let us not grow weary. And you're facing racism, I'm sorry, and you're facing systemic racism group and your wonderful worship and the many activities of ELPC with your marvelous ministers and musicians and members and technical staff and cleaning crew and assorted blessed and highly favored keepers of the flame and the connections and the friendship and the love. Let us march on till victory is won. We've got the best of all possible help in the work we are determined to complete. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything you have done. Thank you for everything you are doing. Thank you for everything that you will yet do. Amen and amen.